because even a sector like climate change has a lot of niche niches yeah. so i cannot be a water expert an energy expert a what a land degradation <laughs> what what no ways no way say we need to find solutions whether um, using science taking science into practice or using our traditional knowledge to address some of these issues that we have it's very important that we also transition because science has already proven that the climate is changing we ourselves are experiencing it in terms of the history if we have to go back and you know you remembering that during christmas you still were able to stand in the crop field well climate finance is actually financing for mitigation and adaptation initiatives um, if i come up with my innovation no matter how good it is sometimes our communities also fail to support us yeah. we fail to support one another so i think we also have to do away with that mentality and start producing and supporting our own products Welcome to Rise and Impact podcast where we celebrate in the incredible young people who are changing the world one community at a time. Each episode I will be interviewing the next generation of change makers just to explore uh, their stories, their insights and achievements. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button for you to be notified whenever we release an episode. This is the Rise and Impact podcast and I'm your host Elizabeth Julepe. So much thank you for actually coming through. I really, really, really like, appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. So, can you just maybe like tell the audience like who you are and just just a little bit about yourself? Okay, my name is Toini Amutenya. I am a climate justice and social justice activist, and also a activist for sustainable development. Mm -hmm. I've been in the field for almost a decade now, mm -hmm. over a decade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I've always been passionate about environmental protection and then just branching out to addressing climate change challenges in the communities in society and also just you know um, being much on the national forefront in terms of um, ensuring that ad policies advocate for youth inclusivity um, especially when it comes to climate ch uh, change agendas mm -hmm and yeah um i'm also in the field of climate finance um that's my profession oh. yeah and yeah other than that i'm just mm -hmm. yeah a national passionate advocate for change okay thank you so much and i really like appreciate because you were one of actually the people like from when i started like uh, when i actually came i think in the climate sector you and dion were the people that actually like um, helped me from the start even before I knew, like I didn't know much about the whole thing. So I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like you were also like nominated, you also, okay, not nominated, but you were part of the mm -hmm. top 100 uh, young African African leaders mm -hmm. in the conservation. So like, what do you, how do you believe that the youth can play like a crucial role in um, climate change and as well promoting, um, promoting environmental sustainability and impact like in the whole continent? Namibia. Yeah, um, I would actually draw from my story okay. um, how I started. Yeah. You know, it's all about advocacy. As Namibian youth and youth in general, we have quite a very strong foundation mm -hmm. in ensuring that the education that we know mm -hmm. could actually reach um, across and beyond, mm -hmm. and ensuring that communities who are don't have the privileges of actu actually being in the platforms of gaining such knowledge are aware. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of our advocacy um, um, and creating awareness locally. So in terms of the top 100 young African conservation mm -hmm. leaders, um, I actually was recognized because of the, um, the, uh, the, the, the work that I have done um, in terms of research in the biodiversity field mm -hmm. and as well as creating awareness, um, educating school going children on biodiversity conservation um, and citizen science in general. So. It's, it's, it's just about us, the youth, being out there and um, contributing to these kind of sectors um, through education, awareness, and also just transformational change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see, I see. So, like, how did you, like, like break into the industry, like, it's all, like, <laughs> like maybe is there a certain project that you worked on or something? Yeah, um, I've always been um, a debater, you know, oh. like debating in schools. And whenever we come to the environmental topics, mm -hmm. I've always, you know, like, been very much expressional in terms of um, my debates and strategic 
analysis um, in terms of communication as well. So me breaking into the field was definitely through um, a lot of reading and understanding what exactly I wanted to go with um, and where my interest lies. And of course, joining um, environmental clubs. Um, at that time, I was part of the Kirtman Swap Environmental Club um, in 2010. It's not 2010. Yeah, 2010, 2009 <laughs> to 2010 when I was still in secondary school. And we have done a lot of initiatives. So um, we did a lot of exposure in terms of traveling through excursions. And that's just where my passion started. Um, I think I, I was introduced to the Hudia Godoni um, succulent plant that was then very much um, threatened. And I was such a strong advocate for that specific plant. I still am. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's where my journey with environmental protection started. Yeah. So you started like in the south. Yeah, I'm a southern girl. I'm actually born and raised in Luderitz. Um really? Yes. Okay, <laughs> and good. I also completed my secondary school in Karas, of mm -hmm. course, Kate Manswap, mm -hmm. J. A. Nyal Secondary School. Oh. Yeah, and um, I think that's that's just where my whole journey in environmental protection started. Mm -hmm. And then I pursued a career in it, in it, and then now I'm actually living the passion and. The profession part of it so it's, for me it's it's i'm actually doing what i love yeah, that's yeah. That, that's very really incredible because like i didn't like from the start i didn't know that you can actually like make a career out of like in anything that has to do with environmental or climate action like i didn't know and growing up it grow like growing up in the north i have also been impacted by climate because there's drought they sometimes when some part of the Angona region we experience like um flooding and all that but then i was like oh, that's a government's job so <laughs> I I didn't know that I had actually a role like to play into and all that. So yeah, but now I kind of like understand better and I kind of know. And I'm actually also from the south though. You are? Yeah. Oh my but, gosh. but I schooled in Kidman's as well from grade five until grade twelve. Okay. Yeah. Which school was that? Not like in Kidman's as well, but between Kidman's and Mariendo in Chess. Oh, okay, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. so that's where I schooled and uh yeah. Oh, awesome. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that about you. I was going to know that you also, I thought you were like, you have been in window for a long time. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> okay, and then like uh, continuing, you started an organization here for Ken now, yeah. which is like a, a great milestone as well, and yes. also an opportunity, of, like creating an opportunity for actually a platform for other Namibian youth to actually as well dive into the, in the whole environmental climate system. So what really like motivated you to... I know it's your passion, right? <laughs> but like what really motivated you to start like this organization and like what are maybe your long term goals for the organization? As yeah. Well? You see I'm smiling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, you know, it's it's often it's like when you ask somebody eh? about something that they are so passionate about, they dream, they drink, they breathe about it, you exactly. know. Um for me, Youth for Ken is actually a baby that started in 2007 nah. yes 2007 I had a desire of just coming up with an organization nah. but I had no prior structure of how it's nah. gonna turn out um, fast forward nah. to studying tertiary education um, understanding who I wanted to be and still having the framework because if I can show you how it was when I was just a kid nah. and how it is right now nah. it's, it's amazing how it transformed but um, the idea was actually just to establish something that was going to be a youth representative platform mm -hmm. um, where we come together as Namibian youth to deliberate on issues that are affecting us and not just to um, practically deliberate on them but also take action orientated initiatives um, to our social settings and ensuring that you know we contribute to the agenda that is being um, advocated for on an international and a national level. So for me, it was just a platform. A platform as such was really lacking that harnesses and brings together the Namibian youth, you know. Um, and then discovering it, you know, and also seeing and being exposed as well, yeah. um, you would understand that wow, I think there is quite a lack. And Youth for Ken as a network then came to make sure that that lack or that gap is actually well maintained. Um, and what we do now is just we we have members across um, all the 14 regions of Namibia. We convene in meetings and we deliberate on what next um, and also share what projects and opportunities are out there 
and also just you know like put our minds together and walk towards um how better can we then bring ourselves out there as Namibian youth to make sure that our voices are stronger together and our actions are taken into account and also just being recognized as stakeholders because youth are actually not as well recognized as stakeholders it's now that we are seeing us being um, a priority in um, workshops and invitations making sure that there is a youth representative but most often it's just one person you know you don't carry the magnitude the, the voices of the rest so youth for Ken then was established to make sure that even in decision making rooms especially when it comes to priority areas related to climate change the youth voices are there and they are notified of what's going on what's happening what opportunities are there how can i contribute as a youth you know how i'm going to reach you know wherever you might find yourself and um, taking into a, the account um, the diversity of our country, yeah. um, the challenges are not similar. Mm -hmm. um, of course, a youth who is in Karas mm -hmm. um, might not have the same needs in terms of addressing certain issues as a youth who is in Zambezi region um, because of the landscape and climate ver uh, variabilities. So, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's that's the birth of youth who can actually just came about mm -hmm. to ensure that Namibian youth do come together and that's really like yes. really, really very much needed yeah and because like stronger like uh, together we are actually more stronger and older exactly. and i love the way like you s like the way you speak about everything because like you really speak it with passion you can i do <laughs> Sorry. It's like you are reading from somewhere or something, but it's really good like when you speak about your passion and all this. Okay, like now you have worked on various projects as well, and you have been in the industry for a decade, as you say. So what are some of the climate-related issues that we experience like in a country as Namibia? Because like, um, like even me growing up, I just know about climate, and, but I don't even know what climate, what issues are there that are related to climate change, even in between different regions and all this. Like what climate related issues are there like in the country in different things like that? Yeah. Well, the basic one that we are mostly commonly affected on mm -hmm. is the low rainfall mm -hmm. um, or the uncertainty of it. Um, it affects us across, yeah. especially in Namibia. There comes a time when we just don't know if it's going to rain, especially the last uh, rainfall season. Mm -hmm. We all were not sure. And then when it came, unfortunately, this time was like flush uh, floods, yeah. um, which, you know, impacted our properties, um, destroyed and damaged as well as other losses, you know. But in particular, Namibia's problem when it comes to low um, rainfall is often, you know, leading to drought. Um, and those droughts lead to water scarcity, which affects our food. You know, we experience food insecurity and we often feel it across all the regions in yeah. Namibia. Um, and we also see inflation in terms of food prices and, and, and as you continue. So that is one of the unique challenges that we both can advocate um, against that, no, you know, climate change is real. Um, we have, you know, uncertainties in weather, especially rainfall. And we need to come together as a country and see how best do we address this need and challenge, um, especially when it comes to it affecting the vulnerable communities um, that might not be, especially the ones that are in remote areas, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they often just go to the city or to town, you know, once a month. Um, and then once set, you know, in their landscape, it's dry. Um, you know, there's no, pro I mean, drinkable water. Yeah. You know, those kind of stuff, um, those are some of the major challenges that we commonly have um, in the country. Yeah, that's really true. Because like even the, when you speak of the low rainfall or the uncertainty of it, like even me from the Angona region, we like, especially now this year, we only, I think, received rain, I think at the beginning, like at the end of November. And then in December, it was kind of as well dry. And then some people did not even manage to plow yeah. their fields and all that. But some that actually like plowed, I think in November, they kind of had some crops. But ah, but most of the like the farms, especially in the, the regions that are where actually people, I think they are dependent on crop farming. Like we are really suffering. Yeah, no, we are indeed. I think even this year already, we could see that the drought relief fund would not be able to 
practically sustain what is out there in terms of the vulnerability of people. Yeah. I, I think somewhere in the newspaper there was like 30,000 people from Amusati were queuing up to receive drought relief um, packages, you know. That is already a concern. We yeah. are not even halfway through into the year and often we would await our next rainfall season to start in October, which is no yeah. longer something that we could rely on because now October would go absolutely yeah. dry exactly. and then somewhere in December I even remember when I was young you know <laughs> that time in December you'd be sitting in your grandmother's field exactly. and the crops mm -hmm. would be at this size yeah exactly. but now it's like you go into Christmas and it's still dry you haven't plowed That's nothing at all and then it's January and it's still dry and then you know this kind of uncertainties are what affects us and it really has to um, take us off the ground and say we need to find solutions whether um, using science, taking science into practice, or using our traditional knowledge to address some of these issues that we have. It's very important that we also transition because science has already proven that the climate is changing. Mm -hmm. We ourselves are experiencing it in terms of the history. If we have to go back and, you know, you remembering that during Christmas you still were mm -hmm able to stand in the crop yeah. field yeah. now that's not possible anymore yeah. it should ideologically you know like trigger you to think about a solution um that could address such an issue whether it's ensuring that we we go into irrigation mm -hmm. whether it's us you know transitioning to much more resilient um, and drought resistant crops yeah. um or you know just farming at the low a lower scale um, there's so much happening in terms of gardening um, that could be able to sustain us as we wait for the next rainfall season. Because, I mean, really a lot of just changed and we can no longer live as ignorantly looking at the situations that we have and just not try to find solutions. And that's where the youth are actually needed. That's where we need to use the skills that we gain from our tertiary educations or our vocational trainings to come up with solutions that will address these kind of issues yeah. so yeah you see where it's yeah. trying to go now <laughs> yeah so basically we have a long way to go especially yeah. as namibian youth um but i so much believe in us and i know that we are capable yeah, yeah that's very true. <laughs> and i think it's going to be kind of hard especially convincing our old uh, like our older generation as well because i remember in december my brother telling my mom that we have to change the way we uh, plow and then we have to leave some part of the land not being plowed and everything and then like we only have to plan like to do crop rotation actually and she was going on she didn't want at all like yeah. she has to plow the whole field of mahango and like there is no rain and there's no okay but i wanted to speak of climate finance since mm -hmm. you say it's your your like like what is climate finance like it like what is it all about or what is it yeah the general, general definition yeah, yeah. Well, climate finance is actually financing for mitigation and adaptation initiatives. Mm -hmm. That's the general, it, where the, wherever it comes from, it can be international funding mm -hmm. that is you know, made available by countries like the developed nations to assist countries like Namibia and vulnerable countries to mm -hmm. um, address issues related to climate change through yeah. mitigation and adaptation initiatives. It can be through private sector, funding such as you know like um, loan based funding to make sure that we just transition in terms of our energy to go much more renewable yeah it, it's actually in provided in different formats but in general it's just financing for mitigation and adaptation in order to address climate change challenges so like you youth for can actually hosted recently hosted the national youth climate summit and like the Namibian Alpha as well 2023 so what were some of the outcomes of from the event as well and like yeah just the general how the event went and everything well yeah. <laughs> it's often difficult <laughs> as as a coordinator of mm. such an event you know mm. it's for me it 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 went amazingly well mm -hmm. Um, I think the three-day session was amazing, seeing the Namibian youth come together and deliberate and showing their passion and their frustration mm -hmm. and coming up with solutions that are very innovative and skillful mm -hmm. was amazing. Mm -hmm. But I, I cannot give an overall yeah. review of mm -hmm. it, but of course I did receive like some um, internal, you know, um, appreciation mm -hmm. of, you know, um, coming up with such a, a very 
uh, youth-led um, kind of organized event to discuss on issues that are affecting us. And the fact that we we deliberated on, on, on various issues when it mm. comes to the priorities of Namibia and addressing climate change. Mm. So we looked at water security issues, food mm. security issues, sustainable industry and, um, and development issues, um, resilient infrastructure issues, energy access and generation issues. We also looked at disaster risk management mm -hmm. and um, also sustainable land management and livelihood in general. So we could see a lot of, you know, um, innovation and skillful solutions that were being um, brought to the forefront by the youth themselves. And the overall message, especially um, after developing this national youth statement, which mm -hmm. was harnessed from all the contributions from the youth that participated, um, was that the youth are hungry for resources, mm -hmm. number one. Mm -hmm. They are hungry for opportunities, and they are hungry for the transfer of skills. Mm -hmm. um, so what they seek is for, for um, demands to mm -hmm. themselves to make them available, themselves available, to um, ensure and take advantage of these opportunities if they are provided, right? And then um, demands to the government to take initiatives that would ensure that they get the skills and they get resources yeah. um, to take part in ensuring that these agendas are youth inclusive. Um, let's say, for example, taking climate actions. Uh, you, you're talking about adaptation and mitigation projects. The youth are innovative. They are at the local setting. They want, they have ideas but how do they make their ideas bankable um, to receive grants and funding to implement? So those were some of the demands that were coming out. You know, in terms of resources, we need resources to ensure that we also play our part. You know, um, we also need skills, um, especially those that are related to digital transformation skills. Um, and you know, skills in terms of how to produce or come up or develop mm -hmm. um, project pipelines for us to be able to apply for these grants that are available. And in general, just, you know, like, how do we um, uh, coordinate ourselves as youth, you know, and make sure that we also are able to apply for fundings mm -hmm. and get it, you know, those kind of stuff. So yeah. they were really deliberating and they came up with very amazing demands. We are working on um, a layout, and once we are done with that, we're going to publish the whole statement um, online, um, and we're also going to mainstream it and make sure that it's well publicized out there. Um, yeah, and we might as well share it probably with you so that yeah, you can share it with your audiences. I love um, it. It's an amazing document, very straightforward. We know we, we're tired of talking, yeah, and we now want to go into action, but we also wanted to understand if we were to go into action, what kind of actions would be um, youth focused, you know, which which ones would trigger us to be part of the agendas, um, you know, because we like unique things anyways. Yeah. Um, we like entertainment, um, we like innovation, so just making it very youth focused, yeah, mm -hmm. taking them into account. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they came up with those kind of demands and they really were transformational innovative mm -hmm. I, I was blown away you know really? um, when they were doing presentations of mm -hmm. the outcomes of their thematic groups mm -hmm. in terms of the seven uh, priority areas mm -hmm. Namibian youth are very smart mm -hmm. articulated mm -hmm. innovative and go-getters I think the only thing that we need to, to realize and do now is to make sure that we provide them with those opportunities and platforms and resources and give them the skills that they need and then a lot of things would actually be youth-led yeah a lot of climate it's actions will be youth-led yeah specifically yeah. exactly <laughs> that's really true and, and i think like it's just the platforms that are actually like lacking and opportunities yeah and in platforms we're actually talking about let's say for example hubs mm, you yeah. know where youth can come together and gain some skills or where they can bring their innovations, you know, and them getting skills and, you know, digital, um, innovative, you know, or getting, you know, those kind of stuff, just yeah. building on to what you already have to make it so much unique and internationally 
productive yeah. or you know adding standards to your products yeah. those kind of innovations and hubs and platforms those are what we need yeah. so for me and ex of course resources yeah. um, because a lot of us put in a lot of time yeah. and you want to actually benefit from whatever you are putting out there um, so resources number one of course yeah. there's always been in terms of resources it's financing mm -hmm. guys um, in terms of capital financing yeah. seed funds grants um, and support from us as well you know I've come to realize that um, if I come up with my innovation no mm -hmm. matter how good it is sometimes our communities also fail to support us yeah. we fail to support one another so I think we also have to do away with that mentality okay. and start producing and supporting our own products um, and I think once we have Establish that, mm -hmm. then we can look at what else can we do, but we also need to support one another. That's very true. That's most definitely needed. Because yeah. that's actually the only way we can actually like move forward. Exactly. That's it. That's it. Like okay, like what are some of the bigger challenges that you guys came across, like hosting the whole event and all that? Yeah, there's always challenges. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> actually yet recovering from the In whole. The, yeah, I can just imagine. Uh, yeah, it, it's. <laughs> It's it's been overwhelming since mm -hmm. you know it's almost like you put in all mm -hmm. the work you go all out yeah and now that it's hosted and done it's you are one. trying to like get back that whole energy that you were losing all the way through mm -hmm. um, but you know some of the challenges that we have experienced were not that major mm -hmm. um, because we had a great team mm -hmm. Um, a very great planning committee team that we put together that consisted of our partners um, and of course getting knowledge from across and beyond you know we even had CDKN all the way from South South North in South Africa oh, okay. um, you know like guide us into how we should make sure that this event is is a great success you know it it was the challenges were there mm -hmm. but at the same time I, we had quite a lot of mentorship um, quite a lot of support um, quite a lot of um, examples to draw from um, and yeah some of I mean there were no challenge that we could not mitigate I would say um, and I'm certain as well you know even on the last day we had a major challenge uh, which could have probably been dooming the whole you know summit but the good thing is always having a mitigation um, if you have a mitigation um, portfolio, mm -hmm. or let's say management or risk management la rather, mm -hmm. at place, mm -hmm. you always know that if this is to happen, then we should be able to do this. Yes. Um, and you have a lot of minds of people that have facilitated, organized, um, and are qualified in stakeholder management and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was easier. And you're getting that kind of knowledge as well from others, mm -hmm. um, and them telling you, you should be on the lookout for that because it might happen oh. you know and, and you're like aha yeah let's do that let's you know and at the end of the day really all these challenges were manageable um, they were manageable um, and I would say the most internal ones yeah we still have to take them up but those are not some of them that I'll be able to share like you know uh, publicly about but definitely there is this power in just cooperation collaboration um, I think in general also reputation wise and building relationships um, kind of like make things way much more easier for you because you can always go back to those relations that you have built yeah. and as guys uh, we are actually working towards this project but we want to understand the lessons learned that you have experienced with a similar project so that we don't make or replicate the same mistakes that you have done so those kind of stuff in terms of management and implementation yeah. are what made the summit a great success I think yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love the smile actually. <laughs> no, for real. And for me, it was a great success. Um, every day I went to the summit, yeah. every day I woke up to go to the exactly. summit, I was just like, God, please, you know, just let it, let this be just excellent, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. let it, yeah, and it really always turned out excellent. Uh, the participants were happy with the programs, mm -hmm. they were engaging, they were, you know, passionate. Um, you know, they, they, 
not just that they felt involved but they were really involved oh, yeah. in the processes and that's what makes it very much unique um, in terms of the contribution it was really their event um, it was really their event and um, at, you know sometimes we, we really want to voice out mm -hmm. our frustration and our needs and when these platforms are not provided yeah. uh, we tend to build up with this frustration so when a, when a solution comes when a platform comes and you are easily able to do so and the fact that you can actually do that one you can speak about it mm -hmm. you can write about it you can deliberate about it you you break down into sessions and whatever way you feel comfortable you contribute mm -hmm. that was amazing mm -hmm. i can just imagine and i think like it, like it was really like a great platform because i think for the very first time maybe and youth were given a platform where they can actually like voice out and be heard and talking actually to the right people and not just talking like maybe on social media and voicing out and not th reaching the right people actually so the right people were actually the people from the different ministries that actually needed to hear what the youth exactly. wanted they were there and i think that's really what the youth wanted and all that for the very first time so thank you so much actually for that and all that so yeah you you are actually like a great inspiration to many namibian youth especially like in the environmental sector me specifically as well <laughs> and i was even like let me even tell you like i was even shocked i think like the very first time when i sent you an email i don't know if you, i think it was on facebook when i reached out um i was very shocked like that you replied i was like Aww. how can did she really just reply to my email that she's going to be part of my panel discussion? Aww. And so thank you so much so for actually just being down to earth and being able, like actually just reaching out to other young people as well and be just, yeah, yeah giving us. <laughs> okay, so um, let me not putting pressure on you actually. No, <laughs> of course not. I mean, I love, um, I actually love the, the engagement mm. beyond just my profession. Mm. Um, I... I, I was mentored mm -hmm. and I feel an obligation to do so to the next person. Mm -hmm. So um, as much as, you know, sometimes people feel like you're going out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. I feel like the comfort zone is where you actually need to branch out mm -hmm. and make sure that you really do understand the challenges that are on the ground. You know, I work with communities, mm -hmm. like I do go out in the fields, <laughs> dusty, dusty fields, yeah. and you communicate with communities like in local settings. And you would see how they open up yeah. um, their vulnerabilities, their challenges. And, you know, you being able to support another youth mm. to bring a platform and engagement, um, you know, to a forefront mm. uh, in whatever way you can. I don't think that's, that's, that's a challenge if you can do it. Mm. Um, and stepping out of your comfort zone can actually empower another person yeah. to to take up space as well in that field that you are because it's boring you know um it being only a certain individual that is known and, you know oh, yeah. it's, it's really boring it gets it gets hectic in terms of your representation and um yeah and and, and there's really a need for namibian youth to just come on the climate change board and the environmental boards um, you know the sustainability board it's like there's so much room and that room needs to be shared so there's no need to feel like mm, yeah, you know <laughs> yeah of course not so yeah no it's about working together man like yeah. we all need one another right. the world would be a better place if we just can all accommodate one another That's right. respectively exactly <laughs> <laughs> so okay like looking ahead as well like what are your hopes and aspiration in the youth-led climate action movement in Namibia and Africa as a whole and like how can maybe listeners as well be a support to this effort as well and mm. that listen out in the world? yeah that's a very good <laughs> one okay um in general mm. you know these challenges number one mm. is our challenges right um this is our era this mm. is our generation to make change your generation to contribute mm. your generation to play your part your time you know to be resourceful um in whatever way whether you are into societal issues mm. whether you are environmental issues financial issues you know all this it's funny how the sustainable development pillar actually mm. has economy social mm. and environment yeah. meaning 
all those uh, cohesively are supposed to be protected. Uh, none beyond the other one. The other one would not exist uh, in the expense of the other. So it's it's looking at those aspects um, and identifying what what role would you want to play yeah. as an African youth, as an Namibian youth, to contribute to societal issues and challenges, and make sure that you your contribution is positive mm -hmm. and it's addressing something and it's bringing change and it's transformational and exciting, you know, because they, there is a lot that we all can do. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us are good at talking, yeah. some are good at painting art, mm -hmm. some are good at, you know, um, engagements like mm -hmm. yourself, you know, um, some are good at innovations, mm -hmm. you know, the likes and the likes. So it's good to identify first um, who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, identifying who you are would make it much more easier for you to understand what is it that you advocate for. Once you identify what you advocate for, it's much more easier to come up with a solution or with an idea that would make sure that your, your advocacy is heard, it's addressed, and the needs, therefore, is also um, addressed in, you know, in society and the like. So in terms of inspiration, I would say just start with who you are first. Your identity presents a lot because you don't want to find yourself in a field or advocating for something that you do not understand or that you are not passionate about because you'll only be there for two, three years. You'll feel worn out. Um, but if you are in a field that you really do understand and you are passionate about and you have identified the niche because even a sector like climate change has a lot of niche niches yeah. yeah so you cannot like i would say i'm a climate change justice climate climate justice activist mm. sustainable development advocate mm. yeah good mm. but then there is like a lot of channels there is water yeah. there is energy there is environmental yeah. there is policy there is da 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 there's a lot of niches so i cannot be a water expert an energy expert oh. a what a land it's degradation a what what <laughs> No ways, no ways. I may understand the depth of how it takes for us to ensure that um, environmental protection is addressed in all those sectors, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make me an expert in all. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to make me an advocate for all. Yes, in general, when you say environmental and climate change, yes. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to branching out into sectors, there are people that have much more knowledge um, and are able to address or act in that kind of field way better mm -hmm. because i'm now in windhoek mm -hmm. you know and my advocacy is more on ensuring that those policies that are coming out of there mm -hmm. are inclusive of youth mm -hmm. you know opportunities mm -hmm. are created for the youth to engage whether it's on water sector who a youth who is probably sitting in wangwena mm -hmm. who knows water issues to an extreme mm -hmm. would then be able to get into those platforms and making sure that whatever those policies are saying, he, under the water sector, can then go and implement. And by providing that platform that we have provided mm -hmm. to a mainstream and make them understand in depth of what those policies are, you get. Yeah. So me, I'm much more on the policy level. Mm -hmm. Someone else will be much more on the action-orientated level. But I also do implement projects. Mm -hmm. But only projects that are in the field that I currently do understand like creating mm -hmm. awareness that is just knowledge transfer but it doesn't make me a water expert yeah. an energy expert um energy and climate change expert yeah. no i cannot talk in depth of that i can only talk that we need to in, um invest in renewable energy mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but then someone who has more expert will be able to find innovations in terms of those energies um find you know address local issues in terms of that energy sector and climate change mm -hmm. you get so in terms of inspiration mm -hmm. understand yourself choose a niche run with it mm -hmm. contribute because the world really needs to be a better place yeah. but it can only be a better place if you also do contribute to making it a better place that's very true and i think that's where we actually even get lost because when you call yourself I mean, a climate activist you expect yourself to be in every when they speak of water you are there when they speak of energy you are there every yeah, exactly. exactly. And we just get lost and get confused. Exactly, exactly. That's very true. So thank you so much for coming through once again. And like any last words or maybe any last questions or something like that. Or any oh, 
I'm, I'm so bad with last <laughs> words because most of them people say in 20 words, uh, yeah. say something and I'll be like, 100 words? Yeah. <laughs> but in general, it's just that um, I'm a passionate Namibian child mm -hmm. and with my passion, um, I have created a platform Mm. But I also want to empower another passionate Namibian child mm. to build on the platform that probably I've created or somebody else have created. Yeah. There is so much that we can do together um, and we need to collaborate and build healthy relationships. Healthy relationships in terms of us being able to communicate um, and support one another and also, you know, address these issues that we have collectively. Um, yeah. So in terms of um, the challenges that we have, mm. like I said, you cannot have, you have, you don't have to carry a lot of niches. Mm. You just need one to run with it. And you need others then to come on board to complement your idea, to complement your advocacy, to complement your work. But together we can do so much. Together we can do so much. Um, yeah, like I said, those were supposed to be the last words. <laughs> but now I'm like, I almost ended like to say, you know, one day I was approached by somebody mm -hmm. and they were like, if we were to reach out to Namibian youth mm -hmm. in terms of addressing climate change challenges, who do we go to? Mm -hmm. And how many people can they reach? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And that was before we even registered Youth for Camp, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But that was a good question because yeah. there is no cohesiveness. Like, where do I go? Exactly. Most organizations are established, they are based in Windhoek, but mm. they are not branched out, you know, into regions. Yeah. Like, if I want to implement a project now in Kunene, will I be able to get a youth that would be able to implement that project? Yeah. Or will we go to search? Mm -hmm. You know, those kind of stuff. So, let's support one another, let's create platforms for each other mm. to deliberate and contribute towards and share opportunities. Yeah. Um, share opportunities with others. You know, um, Namibia is not well represented when it comes to um, youth participation in certain networks and events across internationally, mm -hmm. let me say. Yeah. And that's because we don't share those opportunities with mm -hmm. others. So let's share these opportunities. Let's um, also support one another to apply for these kind of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's just live happy yeah. and build healthy relationships. That's very true. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> it was really nice talking to you and also meeting you in person because yeah. I think it was always just um, email-wise, yeah. phone call. I think yeah. for the past three, is it two or three years? I yeah, think. three years yes, or so. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much. This is actually the end.